Hey everyone, my name is Iman Chaudhry. And my name is Danielle Solish, and today you're listening to the 12th episode of Seeing Clearly, a pre-clerkship guide to all things ophthalmology. On today's episode, we're going to be interviewing Dr. Martin Tenhove. So Dr. Tenhove is the head of the Department of Ophthalmology at Queen's University, a position which he has held since 2012. Dr. Tenhove completed his medical degree at Queen's University and then went on to complete a fellowship in neuro-ophthalmology at Bascom Palmer at the University of Miami, eventually bringing him back to practice in Kingston. Dr. Tenhove's primary research focus is neural mechanisms underlying visual attention, and he's now developed a secondary research focus on looking at healthcare delivery models in ophthalmology. He is also a passionate teacher and was the recipient of the Garth Taylor Excellence in Teaching Award, as well as the Pyro Award for Clinical Educators. He was recognized with the Medical Staff Outstanding Clinician Award. And without further ado, we are very excited to welcome Dr. Tenhove. Thank you. It's a real privilege to be here. Um, well, I guess we'll just uh, dive into our first question here. Um, so Dr. Tenhove, what uh, drew you to the field of ophthalmology? So in medical school, I, I was not at all decided, uh, which I guess isn't uh, all that uncommon, on which specialty to go into. And in fact, I was drawn to the procedural specialties like um, neurosurgery was one, uh, eMERGE was another. Um, and it, I really didn't give ophthalmology much thought at all until um, in, in my fourth year, uh, where somebody had was listening to what I'd liked and 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 actually suggested neuro ophthalmology if you can believe it as a nice combination of surgical skills and the neurosciences that I was looking for um, and uh, and then I considered that and I looked a little bit into what intraocular surgery was like and and um, I was taken almost immediately by what I thought at the time was just the the simplicity and and the beauty of it it's really quite a very pretty organ to uh, to operate on. No, that, that's that's excellent. I feel like it's actually interesting. A few of our guests have had that overlap as well with you know neuroscience, like and neurosurgery, and then like ophthalmology, like that microsurgery appeal. But that's great. And so, on the note of neuro ophthalmology, would you mind to describe a bit about what a day in the life of a neuro ophthalmologist looks like? Sure. Um, well, so neuro ophthalmology is is all things considered. Um, that, that involve the processing of vision or the direction of the eye movements. And then there's a few other layers as well. And it's been said that um, there isn't a, a neuro disease, a neurological disease that doesn't have some neuro ophthalmic manifestations. And I don't know if that's exactly true. There might be one or two, but it is true that um, the vision system and the ocular motility system uh, covers so much territory in the brain and the brain stem that it's it's certainly conceivable that if you're a really good clinician and you can pull out these um, clinical signs, um, you can make a lot of diagnoses um, based on a just a very good examination of the patient and, and of course, good history of the patient as well. So that certainly um, drew me to neuro-ophthalmology. And, and when I am in clinic, um, clinics are a little slower um, because the history is so important. Um, in other areas of ophthalmology, glaucoma um, and retina, for example, the, the history is important, but um, clinicians don't spend as much time taking it. it it's, it's a little bit more formulaic mm -hmm. in terms of um, the approach. Um, when you're dealing with neuro-ophthalmology, you really need to go back to first principles that you learned in first and second year medical school mm -hmm. um, and, and rely on, on building the, uh, the problem list and diving down into each problem, which may or may not be connected with another problem, um, and in getting all of the, the metrics of the problem together. Uh, and then actually a lot of the diagnoses um, are already formed by the time you're finished your history or at least partially formed, because you have a good idea of what, what sector of the brainstem or what sector um, is involved based on what the patient is or isn't reporting. So, mm -hmm. so that's kind of the detective work um, in, in seeing patients, but it takes time. So typically I would see uh, about 20 odd patients uh, in a day. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm fortunate enough to be in a teaching center. So I'm usually with one resident, sometimes two. 
um, and, uh, and and the odd medical student that comes in to observe. Um, and so that's that's a typical uh, clinic day, but the variety of problems that we would see um, is all over the map. We might see strokes, we might see a new presentation of multiple sclerosis, uh, we might see a vasculitis of some kind. We might see idiopathic intracranial hypertension, which is a, a condition that's um, tied to obesity, which is sadly rearing its head in prevalence these days, um, and, and a pupil disorder, a concussion. Um, there's, there's just endless um, uh, types of presentations that we would see. So it's, it's a very, it's a grab bag of, of, of um, diagnoses and, and really every clinic has a little bit of a different flavor. So that would take pretty much the whole day. And I, I normally do that um, two, uh, uh, roughly two days in the week. Um, I used to uh, do a, a, a half day of surgery and a full day of, of general ophthalmology, um, but now I'm department head. So that has been replaced with uh, a, a little bit of emergency clinic coverage and a lot of administration teaching and, and a small amount of research as well. So that rounds out my week. Thank you for, uh, for sharing all of that. I always find it fascinating to hear how diverse uh, every ophthalmologist practice is. Um, I mean, we're not exposed to, to much ophthalmology, I find, in, in medical school and especially pre-clerkship. So to hear about all of the different specialties and then how within each uh, subspecialty everyone's day differs is always quite, uh, quite interesting. So thank you for that insight. Um, and so, as you mentioned, uh, you work with residents and sometimes medical students. Um, and so, do you have any advice on uh, what our listeners and students in general should look for in a residency program or fellowship program? Sure. Um, I, I think this applies outside of just ophthalmology, but um, a residency program in, in, in most specialties um, nowadays is five years. And um, well, that may seem like a long time, and it, it, it is, um, it also goes quickly. Um, but my advice would be, make sure you're picking a residency program that has a good vibe, uh, uh, that treats you like family, that, that looks after one another, um, where the faculty treat you with respect um, and um, don't view you as, as simply um, service. Um, it's, it's really important to have a, the a camaraderie uh, in a residency program where you're going to be working um, so closely with these same individuals for five years. Um, and so spend a bit of time, or at least if you can't, uh, speak to the people, the residents in the program and see if you can get that um, assessment from them. Um, here at Queens, we spend an awful lot of time making sure of that. And, and the, the, the flip side of it is that we, we pull residents into our program who we feel that we can trust, who are ethical, who are hardworking, um, and who we want to bring into what we consider to be our family for five years. Um, and, uh, you know, at the end of the five years, it really does feel like family. They, they actually come to the graduation ceremony with their parents. Um, it's the final graduation, so to speak, uh, for, for most of their educational paths. Um, and, um, you know, it's a, special, it's a special moment for them and, and the parents like to be included as well. And it's, it's, it's nice for all of us to, to sort of wrap it up in a, in a classy way. Oh, that, that's amazing. We actually had um, Celia, one of the residents, the first year residents from Queens, on to our podcast. And one of the first things that she talked about was the family. Like she needs something, she needs to go to dinner. She needs advice about anything in Kingston and her co-residents and all this staff are so responsive and have been amazing. So that's really- it, neat. It's, a, it's a long road and, and it, can be, it can be quite trying uh, to get through residency without having uh, the support system. You're, obviously your, your family of origin's not here. Right. Generally speaking, it's not here. So it's nice to have um, residents, co-residents uh, above you and below you that support you and, mm -hmm. and faculty that are looking out for you. And that's really, that's kind of our DNA that we've, we've strived to achieve here. So I think we've done a pretty good job of it. Um, for fellowship, it's a little bit different because generally speaking, it's, it's a one-year 
uh, rounding off of your um, of your residency and and your, and your training. Um, and it's it's done usually not always, but usually because you're interested in an academic job, and um, and so you can pick something that you're super interested in, and it it can be a really special time in your training because. Um, gone is the pressure of studying for exams. You, you, you've already passed your Royal College exam by that point. Um, and it's kind of like an academic smorgasbord. You, you, you know, you really get to feast on, on the, really the best people in the world uh, in, in a certain topic area. And whether it's surgical skills that you're learning or, or you're enhancing your knowledge base, um, whatever it is, um, you're, you're right at the top of your game. Um, and so when you're selecting a fellowship, it should be with that in mind. Um, if there are multiple uh, mentors in one um, center, it's probably preferable because um, you're, you're picking at that stage, you, you have the skills already to know what makes sense to you and, and, and maybe what doesn't. You don't want to be exactly like one, one mentor. You might want to be a little bit of this mentor and a little bit of that mentor. And so to have multiple multiple mentors to learn from in a one year period, in my mind is preferable. In the old days, they used to have um, a rotating fellowship where you spent uh, two or three months um, in different cities with different mentors and, and you did exactly that. You, you picked and choose what you needed and you came back to an academic job yourself and, and you became some mix of the mentors that you were training with. Um, so I would look for that. And, and again, um, you know, striking the proper service to, uh, to training um, and opportunity ratio is really key. And, and speaking to previous fellows is, is, is absolutely mandatory to, to establish that um, because there are some fellowships that, that might be a little bit too heavy on the service end and, and not enough on the, on the training end. So, I mean, you're you're typically earning less than a, than a PGY-5 uh, during a fellowship. And so you're making a sacrifice uh, for your own education. And, uh, but the trade-off should be that you're getting a good education. And, and if, if that's happening, it's, it's a beautiful time. It's a, it's a great year to spend where you have no pressures of exams, but only the, the thought of becoming the best subspecialist you can be. Yeah, no, that's incredible, especially because residency is such a long road and then you want to end up, you know, learning something that's going to eventually help you in your practice and help all your patients. And so, you know, finding that right program is extremely important. So thanks for all that information. Yeah. Um, I guess my follow-up question, which is kind of on the same realm of like, you talked about things that were different in the past and in the future. So my question to you is what are some opportunities or even risks for ophthalmologists in the upcoming decade and years to come? Sure, um, that's a great question. Uh, the, the opportunities are, are very plentiful. There, there's all kinds of technology. If you think about what's happened since 2008 in the introduction of the smartphone, mm -hmm. um, you know that's all just a little bit more than a decade ago. Um, and now all of a sudden you wouldn't think of going anywhere without a smartphone, without immediate access to really the world's knowledge base in your hand. Um, and that just happened in the last decade. I think there are gonna be a few other changes that are such big paradigm um, shifters. And one of them is going to be artificial intelligence. Um, a lot of ophthalmology is vision uh, and image recognition. Um, and so the fundus, for example, is, is a prime candidate for artificial intelligence uh, to be processed and, um, and be used in an intelligent way um, as a screening tool. And so that's a huge opportunity to get out in front of. Um, there are a lot of people in, in diagnostic imaging as well who are afraid of AI being um, a threat to um, their training. But I see it differently. I, I think that um, it may change the number of ophthalmologists we need in certain um, subspecialties. Um, but I think um, ultimately, if we choose to be afraid of it and not sort of um, embrace it, um, it'll it'll pass us by anyway. So I think I think you better just realize that 
um, it will do certain things better uh, mm -hmm. and it has limitations and and to um, train yourself in recognizing the limitations and being good at filling those gaps is really what your challenge is going to be and, and I think it's not quite clear yet exactly where AI will fit in ophthalmology. Um, I think in neuro ophthalmology, it's probably a little bit uh, less likely to uh, supplant uh, um, all you know the history taking portion. But um, but it's interesting. There, there's some studies already that uh, um, went through uh, some paradigms for history taking. And, and they do quite well. So I, I guess that that's one challenge and, and um, one opportunity. Um, I think the other that needs to be mentioned is how do we work together with optometry? Optometry is um, much larger in scope than ophthalmology. And um, in truth, they're more organized in their lobbying, um, but their training is different, fundamentally different. And I think that we need to find a way to work together um, but also protect the, the fact that we are physicians and surgeons and, um, and we have a, a different training through and coming through medical school. Um, and we need to um, recognize those strengths and play on them. And therein lies a challenge for, for us as, as trainees. We, we need to understand that we're generic physicians first and all of the things that we learn in medical school, we need to bring to the table as ophthalmologists uh, because that's what's distinguishing us from, from optometrists. And if we choose just to become immediately interested in ophthalmology in first year medical school, and we, we go through all these other courses and say, oh, we don't need to learn about infectious disease. We don't need to learn about cardiology. That's a mistake because that's what differentiates us to understand that we're treating the whole body and how how medications interact with different systems and that type of thinking is really critically important um, to keep ophthalmologists, um, um, you know, in in the right spot in the in the treatment treat in the treatment team. Especially with all of the, you know, all the things that you were talking about before with the different diseases that are presented in your clinic and how they relate to so many other body systems and, you know, so many other physicians and you might present with one thing, but something else is going on. It, it really does show like that's the beauty of medicine is that there's so much that interacts within our body and, you know, things may present specific diseases or illnesses may present in one way. And really it's something that's going on, like you said, with the brain, but you see it in something that you've noticed as an ophthalmologist in, in the eye. That, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. oh, and so thank you for, for sharing all of that, uh, especially as medical students, it's it's always incredible to, to hear what uh, the future of the specialty looks like. And um, especially for myself and Danielle, we both have an interest in you know, technology and biotechnology um, and a background in bioinformatics. So hearing you talk about AI and the, the opportunities that um, you know, it, it will serve in ophthalmology. It's, it's pretty incredible to see kind of how it can help us. Of course, I mean, like you mentioned, there's some fear that uh, might take over jobs or, or it might be used um, improperly, but it definitely is a tool that, uh, that can help and benefit our patients. So, so I really appreciate you, uh, you speaking about the opportunities there. Um, so kind of, uh, that's, that's all of our questions related to ophthalmology. Um, and for our listeners um, who know, um, after our questions, we move into a, a more fun segment of the episode, which uh, we'll ask you some would you rather questions. Um, so if you're ready, I'll get started with the first one. Um, so if you were to be reborn in another life, would you rather it be in the past or the future? Um, well, I, I guess... For a very specific reason, I'll say the past. Um, I, I like sailing and, and exploring, and uh, um, I like kind of being out on the ocean, looking around, and not seeing land anywhere. And I, I imagine that I'm one of the early explorers. So <laughs> that if I could drop myself back in the 14th or 15th century, I'd be very happy. Although the boats today are much better, so <laughs> yeah, maybe it would have been one of the first people to discover North America. That would, yeah, that would be pretty exactly. incredible. Yeah. That's awesome. That's a great answer. 
Um, and then our second and final question is, would you rather move to a new city every single week or never leave the city that you were born in? Every single week would be uh, pretty fatiguing, but, um, uh, and, and I, I was born in Hamilton and I really, I, I like Hamilton, unlike uh, it, many people think of <laughs> Hamilton's got a bad reputation, but, but I think my travel bug um, would have to win out that if, if I had to stay in one city the rest of my life, I, that's, that's too big a price to pay. I'd, mm. I'd want to move every week. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think I would agree. It would be a, every week is a lot, but I think it's a, it's an incredible opportunity to travel that much. I'd be, it'd be exhausting, but uh, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah, for it'd, sure. be, it'd be interesting. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Um, okay. So I guess um, with that, uh, we wrapped up all of our questions. Uh, for the episode. So I just wanted to say thank you uh, so much for, for joining us today. It was, um, it was a privilege to be able to listen to uh, the insight you, you shared, and um, I'm sure our listeners will agree. Um, and so to our listeners, thank you so much for listening to this episode of Seeing Clearly. It's our pre-clerkship guide to all things ophthalmology. Uh, to stay caught up with everything else that iCurriculum is doing, be sure to check out our website at www.icurriculum.com and follow us on Instagram at iCurriculum. Uh, thank you so much again, Dr. Tenho, for, for being here with us. Thank you. And, and I wish you and, and your listeners the, the very best. And I hope um, you're all colleagues one day. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay. Bye. Cheers. See you later.